I, <laughs> I've never done this before, but I, I feel strongly led this morning to do this. Um, and I, the reason is not to draw attention to myself at all. I, please hear my heart on this. I, I'm doing it because it relates to the message that God's given me uh, for you. Uh, but to indicate to you how, how, how real this is, I have a, I have a condition in my, in my body. It's, uh, it's something that, uh, it's, uh, it's called, um, what's it called, honey? Laryngeal? Yeah, well, in, there's, okay. There is, there is insanity and there is, you know, some other things, but the one, the one in my throat is laryngeal spasm. Uh, laryngeal spasms. What happens is uh, I can uh, just be minding my own business and all of a sudden my throat will close, just snap shut. And it's like someone is, is choking me to kill me. I can't breathe. And I'm just going... <gasps> and there's absolutely nothing I can do. It's the most... It's just a really, really scary thing when it happens. And... The, you know, we've read literature on it, and, and, and there's two opinions. One is you pass out, and your throat relaxes, and then you can breathe. The other is you pass out, but you can't breathe, <laughs> and so you die. <laughs> and uh, there's, there's no cure for it or anything, but it just happens. And it happened to me quite often on the mission field, but it hasn't happened to me for quite some time. Um, and I, I just thanked the Lord. I just thought, well, maybe, maybe God's healed me. Maybe, you know, because I haven't had any problems. Well, thir- was it Friday night, Friday evening, we were going to go over to some folks' house for, for uh, fellowship and a picnic. And just before we were going to leave, I got an attack of this. And my throat, I thought I was going to die. You just, it's hard to hard to really describe how it feels, but you, it scares you because you, you literally, no air. It just, you can't get any air. And I was, you know, I was seeing spots and I was, you know, you know you, you, they tell you in the literature, don't panic. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> Thank you very much, you know. It's kind of like, you know, some preachers, you know, grab free. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> and and I, finally it subsided and uh, I went to the, we went to the thing and, and hung out with the people and, and came home and, and it literally, I was shaken so bad uh, that I, it, it really shocked my system. It really kind of shocked my, my, my body and I was, I had a you know, pounding headache and, and uh, then Saturday until yesterday until about, um, I don't know, uh, four o'clock in the afternoon. I just was not myself. I was really shaken uh, physically. My, my system was just shocked. And um, I had been praying about it um, yesterday and then uh, uh, again th- this morning. And um, I, I tell you this to say that what I have to share with you is not... It, it, is, it's not when I say Satan is out to steal and to kill and to destroy, he is, he is, and I don't want you to think that that's just spiritually speaking, but that if he could kill me, he would, and that's the, the warfare that we live in, and I, I understand it as that. I understand it as a, a spiritual warfare. I understand it as a part of the attack of the enemy. I understand it as a part of uh, being a soldier of, of the cross, that when you're a soldier of the cross, sometimes you, you take hits. And I don't back away from that. I don't believe in a, in a puff and stuff gospel. Uh, you know, puff and stuff that, that it's all about puff and it's all about you getting stuff. There's churches that teach that and there's, you can go to them, but this isn't one of them, at least not under my watch, because I don't believe in puff and stuff Christianity. I believe that we live in a war zone and we are here to expand the kingdom of God. And when you expand the kingdom of God, there's a fight. There's a war that goes on and you you take hits, but God is always greater. And so I know, and I'm very clear, and I try to teach you, if you fight, you win. If you fight, you win. Amen? And so just as powerful as the enemy is to kill us, 
Jesus is greater and more powerful to give us life. Amen? Where sin abounds, the effects of sin, grace does much more abound. Hallelujah? And so please understand my heart. I'm not afraid. I'm not, I just want to, I, I, I set that, I share that with you to say that the fight that we're in is very real. And it's the fight over, like I mentioned to you last week, it's a fight for you. It's a fight for your heart. It's a fight for your life. It's a war that we're in. And I've chosen to engage, my wife and I have been chosen to, to engage in the fight and to do that. Um, but it, it just, as I was praying, the Lord was saying, you're, you're going to preach this message and you just need to know this is the real deal. And I said, okay. <laughs> just don't let me get those spasms anymore because <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> So with that in mind, then, uh, I want to go to this scripture in Nehemiah. That was a great introduction to him. How many of you are just encouraged? Let's pray and go home right now. No, that's better not. Nehemiah chapter 4, um, well, it's just uh, verse 1. Now it came about that when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. He spoke in the presence of his brothers, uh, and the wealthy men of Samaria, and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? Now, Tobiah, the Ammonite, was near him, and he said, Even what they are building, if a fox should jump on it, he would break down. The, their stone wall, <laughs> He's laughing at them. For 70 years, uh, the people of Israel had uh, been in captivity and Jerusalem laid in ruins. It was a wasteland. Its walls were, were flattened. When the Assyrians came in first, they, they'd do a lot of destruction and a lot of, a lot of killing. That's just what they do. The Babylonians came in after the Assyrians, and the Babylonians take captives. They take prisoners and make them slaves, and this is what was happening to them. Their homes in Jerusalem, their schools, their businesses were deserted. Uh, its temple, the temple of the Lord, had, uh, had been, uh, it was built by Solomon, but it had been destroyed. Uh, the Bab Babylonians had taken captive of many of the people, including the prophets Jeremiah and Daniel and some of the other prophets. And for about three generations, the people of Jerusalem had been held uh, in, in captivity. But now, in this passage, the year is 445 B.C., and a new generation has grown up, and they are a people who are hungry for the things of God. They are a people who, more than anything else, they want to move out of captivity. They want to return to the blessing. They want to return to the promised land. They want to return to the city of David, and they want to rebuild, and they want to go on with their lives as God's people. And uh, they want the blessing of Yahweh and the presence of Yahweh among them once again. And so the message that the, the exiled prophets had spoken, that Jeremiah and uh, Daniel and others had spoken was finding good soil in the hearts of this generation of people and they wanted to rebuild the temple of the Lord. They wanted to come back to God. And so it was a time in the, in the biblical sense, it was a time of revival among the people of Israel and it was a wonderful time. And I can't go into all the history but in answer to their prayer, in answer to their crying out to the Lord, the Lord um, answered them, and God worked in the heart of the Babylonian king, and released uh, he released uh, these capti these captives to go back to Jerusalem. The Lord raised up a leader. His name was Nehemiah, and God anointed him and gave him a plan and gave him strength to be able to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and reestablish the city of the Lord and bring the people back home. And so that's kind of the, the context for this message. In verse 6 it says, So we built the wall, and the whole wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Uh, the Lord opened the doors, and the work began. 
And there was such excitement and there was so much enthusiasm as people were getting involved and uh, that even though uh, in the natural, the job seemed absolutely immense. Can you imagine building a, a, a wall around an entire city? And the enemies around them were laughing at them and making fun of them. One of them says, ha, even a fox, if a fox hit that wall, it would just crumble down. And they're making fun of the Jews who are going back. How can these people work and all that kind of stuff? And, uh, but it didn't matter to them. They, they just got after it. It was a new day, and they went. And it seemed like no time had gone by, and half of the wall had been rebuilt. Half the wall was finished already. And Nehemiah says things were flying along because the people had a mind to work. They went after it. We want our homes back. We want our life back. But time went on. And the Bible says the bricks started getting heavier. <laughs> and the climb up to the higher levels of the wall just began to get higher and higher and harder and harder. And the workers' zeal began to wane. And even though this wall was the work of the Lord and even though they knew that it was a new future for them, the people became, began to be tired. They began to wear out. And in their weariness... Seeing a chance to uh, discourage them, their enemies began to turn up the heat. And it wasn't just about discouraging them slash making them feel bad. It was discouragement, getting them off the wall, stopping. These people didn't want to lose their slaves. These, these enemy nations didn't want Israel to leave. They didn't want the Jews to restore Jerusalem. They wanted their slaves back. And so they began to turn up the heat of persecution. They couldn't just go in because uh, there had been a proclamation by Cyrus that oh, these people can do this. And Nehemiah says that they set out, uh, the enemies set out to demoralize the builders. Verse 7 uh, says, Now when Sanballat, uh, and he is from, he's from the north, and Tobiah, uh, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the repair of the walls of Jerusalem went on and that the breaches began to be closed. They were very angry, verse 8, and all of them conspired together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause a disturbance in it. But we prayed to our God, and because of them we set up a guard against them day and night. Thus in Judah it was said, the strength of the burden bearers is failing, yet there is much rubbish, and we ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. Discouragement, just a message of discouragement and being overwhelmed. Our enemies said, they will not know or see until we come among them and kill them and put a stop to the work. And so from every part of the nations that surrounded uh, Israel at that time, uh, the enemies were closing in to stop this work that was going on. And not only did the, the enemy do all that they could to discourage the Jews and to stop the building, but uh, <laughs> friends, verse 12, when the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times, they will not come, against, come up against us from every place where you may turn. Or they will come up against us from every place. We, uh, friends, ten times the naysayers, the relatives come in from other parts of, of Israel and they say, huh, you know, they're right out there and you're not going to be able to finish. Don't you, when you have friends like that, who, who needs enemies, right? You're trying to get something done and your mother-in-law comes over and tells you how stupid you are. And then your brother-in-law calls you up and says, why are you still doing that? Quit doing that. I remember one time, I was, this isn't in the notes. <clears throat> it's free, no charge. My, I, we were pastor, we just planted a church, and it was a young church, and, it, and, and uh, I'm Assemblies of God, of course, and, and uh, um, God was blessing the church. It was growing, and we were trying, and, and uh, it was about the time when Jimmy Swaggart and Jim Baker and all those guys fell. Right, all those, and the assemblies of God was all over the news. Oh, you know, blah 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 blah. And and 
my aunt calls me. You know, I'm in a battle here. You know, it's hard. It's hard on us as AG preachers. It's, it's just a hard time for the church in general because the church is being mocked by the world. And my aunt calls me up and says, you're an AG preacher, aren't you? I said, yeah, yeah, boy, we're really going through a tough time. And she says, well, who are you sleeping with? Thanks! <laughs> you know, but that's the way it was. And this is what these people, even the people that know you, the people that love you are calling you and say, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. You better stop. Ten times they said this. But look how Nehemiah responds. I love this. Verse 14. And when I saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, and said, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight. Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Hallelujah. Don't be afraid of these people. Don't listen to the naysayers. You remember the Lord. You remember the Lord and you fight. You do it. Hallelujah. Verse 15, when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, then all of us returned to the wall, each one to his work. The work continued. The wall was built and strength returned to the people of God. But this time, as they went back to the wall to work, it wasn't a strength that came from just the zeal of something new, the happiness of getting out, the, the, the happiness of getting started with a new life. This time, it wasn't excitement based on emotion and high feelings. It wasn't a commitment that was based on nostalgia that we're going home and, oh, this is where Aunt Susie used to live, and oh, look, it's all tore up a wolf. It, isn't, it wasn't like that. This time, there was a holy boldness and a confidence that rose up in the people that comes from the Spirit of God and comes when we remember the Lord who is great and who is awesome. Hallelujah. The one who saves us, the one who transforms us. And a deep strength came back and they were able to stand up against any attack, to shake off any distraction, any discouragement, whether it comes from the enemy or whether it comes from well-meaning friends and loved ones. They, it, 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 we are going on. We're going to complete this. We're serving the Lord. And this wall is going to get built. And so the people went back to work. And the Bible says that everyone went back. Look at verse 17. Those who re were rebuilding the wall and those who carried burdens took their load with one hand, uh, uh, took their load with one hand doing the work and the other holding a weapon with one hand doing the work and another hand holding the weapon. In one hand, they had a trowel, just slopping the mud on and putting on the bricks. And in the other hand, they held a sword. Now, the Bible says they held spears, they held shields, they held swords, they held weapons. And it was in that posture, the sword and the trowel, that they completed the work that God had given them to do and they reestablished their household. And they reestablished the city of Jerusalem. I can't think of a more profound picture uh, of what happens when we set out to fulfill God's plans and God's purposes in our lives than, than this. Do you, how many of you remember when Jesus really got a hold, finally really got a hold of your life? You better remember that. Not, not the day you said, uh-huh, to the gospel, but the day God really got a hold of you. For some of us, it was the same day. For some of us, there's a gap, right? We say yes, and then we go, on, and then finally, God gets us. Finally, we move past that infancy, and God begins to do something, and God begins to change us. And, and, and for the first time, you really markedly in your life stepped out and you began to live for God. You moved out of the captivity of sin, out of the captivity and the cycle of the brokenness in your life, and you began to change. You began to grow, and you began to rebuild the ruins of your life. 
Hallelujah. Isn't that a great feeling? And Jesus, it happens to people when, when uh, we get saved and when we truly give our lives to Christ. But that's not the only time that it happens in, in our lives. It happens uh, sometimes when God places a call on our lives. It sure happened to me when God called me into the ministry. Boy, I got beat up from so many sides uh, when that began to happen. Uh, it can happen when, uh, to people when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit and you begin to, to move into the supernatural things of God and you begin to live and pray in a different way. It can happen when you rededicate your life after being away from him for a long time and you finally say, God, I'm going to commit to you. I don't care anymore. Or maybe you've said, Lord, I want a deeper walk with you. I don't want to be a Jesus fan like we talked about last week. I've been a Jesus fan too long. It's time to get serious, and it's really time to walk with you. And you step out in those times to rebuild the wall and to do that spiritual work. It's a fresh start. And, and you remember that in those times, the, the, initial, the initial thing that happens is just so exciting. <laughs> It's so fun to watch people when they get, when they first get, uh, say, when they first come to know Jesus, how it seems like God just answers every one of their prayers immediately. It's just, I was walking, and I said, oh boy, we sure need some rain, and it started raining, oh God, did, you know, just that kind of excitement, and God just answers our prayers, and he takes care of our needs, and, and because he's teaching us, you can trust me, you can trust me, don't worry about it, you can, and it's so exciting. Miracles are happening, and, and it's just that, that excitement of stepping into a new life in the Lord. And in that newfound freedom and in that newfound commitment and passion and, and zeal, you, you just take off. You grew. You learned. You worked. But it wasn't work. It was just, what else would I do with my I love God. I love what he's doing in my life. And so you, you just get after it, and you just grow. And it's so fun to serve the Lord and worship the Lord. And, and the transformation is happening in your life. So many changes. It wasn't that everything that you went through was easy by any means, but it just, it's, it was hard to quit some of the stuff that you were into. Some of the stuff that you were bound by. Some of you were bound by alcohol when you when this happened to you. Some of you were bound to, with other habits and with other things that just God had to set you free. And it was hard. It wasn't easy. But it was good. It was good work. And you, you, you took it with a sense of God is doing a new thing in my life. And every new layer that, that comes upon this wall is, is, is blessed. And before you know it, half the wall is built. And it's exciting. And it just, you feel such a sense of accomplishment. But then it happens. How many know what I'm talking about? You say, Pastor, I know where you're going. <laughs> yeah. Satan sees the changes in you, and you get on his radar screen. That's what happens. You have attracted attention of all these enemy nations. You attracted their attention. And all of a sudden, the old lies come back. All of a sudden, with his ability to intimidate and manipulate, uh, things that used to keep you under control don't keep you under control anymore, so he's got to turn the heat up, and he does, to get you back in line, to drag you back into bondage again, and some of you are right there, and you know what I'm talking about, that, that what happens is the zeal stops, the joy stops, and it gets tough. You start getting slammed. You start getting slammed because the enemy has turned up the heat. And like the enemies of Israel, feelings of condemnation. We talked about condemnation a couple weeks ago. Who do you think you are? You really think this new life of yours, this new commitment that you made is, is going to last? <laughs> Just wait. Just wait. I know you and you know you. You're going to fail. And Satan, the, the accuser, Satan, the father of lies, uh, the one who steals and who kills and who destroys, he sets out to do like he did with these builders. 
And it's interesting, Nehemiah uses the word demoralize. He begins to demoralize you. And he's a master at it. Get down off that wall. You just, you just think you're good. You're, not, you're no good. You, you can't do this. God isn't really doing this. And he uses the craziest people. My aunt. <laughs> He uses people that you would never dream to, to hurt you and to get you off the wall. Someone who's supposed to be a Christian. Someone who's supposed to know better. A pastor. A deacon. A missionary. Happened to my daughter overseas. People are supposed to, supposed to know that person hurts you. That person says something stupid, something mean, something cutting, and, and, and the enemy is right there to say, see, that's the way they all are. That's the way church is. See, they're all like that. That's Christians. That's what, and you hear the, that's Christians. That's what Christians do. They hurt. They kill. They, Christians are the only ones who kill their own young. You know, you, how many have heard that? You know what I'm talking about. And you're tempted to buy the lie, and you're tempted to just give up altogether. You give up on Christians. You give up on church. You give up on God. I hear a lot of one-time builders who are now been demoralized. They've been demoralized, and they'll say, here's what they'll say, and you've heard it. I'm fine with Jesus. I don't have any problem with Jesus. It's the church I can't stand. Anybody ever hear that? What's going on? That's the enemy nations dragging people off the wall. Because it's interesting, those people that say that, very few of them actually get involved in a body of believers. They're usually at home, watching football, you know, eating potato chips, smoking a cigar, drinking a beer. I don't have any problem with Jesus. It's just that church. They're a bunch of hypocrites. <clears throat> Unlike the Jews in verse 12, even friends and even family dishearten you. People you know, people you love, People who in the beginning were very excited to see all the changes that you were making. They, man, it's, it's great that you're finally starting to get your life together. It's wonderful that that's starting to happen. And they encourage you, yeah, keep going. Oh, yeah, keep, keep doing that. Oh, that's wonderful. And then after a while, they're saying things like, church again? <laughs> Didn't you just go last Sunday? <laughs> Didn't you just go last month? <laughs> For some of them. The C and E Christians, man, you'd actually go to church in July? What's wrong with you? No. <clears throat> anyway, they, they, you know, aren't you taking this Jesus stuff a little bit too far? Has anybody had a family member ever say that to you? Aren't you taking this God stuff just a little bit too far? Aren't you, what, what do you think, you're holier than thou? This is what ha happened to me. What, you think you're holier than thou? You're too good to hang around with us now? Your brothers, your sisters, you're too good for us now? What do you mean God called you? We know who you really are. You can't do that. Jesus himself went through that. Uh, uh, the, the, the scripture says that Jesus could really do no miracles, except he healed a few people, which is great. <laughs> but he just couldn't do much in his hometown because his family, it doesn't, oh, we knew Jesus when. Isn't he that carpenter's kid? Yeah, yeah. And that happens to you, to demoralize you, to discourage you, to keep you from moving on. Jesus went through that very thing. And like Israel, under that negative pressure, the, the zeal begins to wane. That, that initial excitement that had you, that was keeping you moving forward, begins to wane, and you, be, you feel empty. And you say, maybe I, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe this Jesus thing is just too, maybe I need to just settle down. 
and just be a good churchgoer and just maybe they're all right and I'm wrong and what's wrong with me? Can I tell you what's wrong with you? I'll tell you what's wrong with you. The same thing was, that was wrong with these Jews who had been released from captivity. The same thing that was wrong with Nehemiah, that's what's wrong with you. The same thing that was wrong. What was wrong with them? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's just that now, along with your trowel, along with just building the wall, it's time for you also to take up a sword and finish the job. And every Christian, everyone who wants to move forward and become a mature man or woman of God has to pick up the sword and finish the job. And that's a tough one because we, 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 we just want God to take care of everything for us. Don't be afraid, Nehemiah said. Don't be discouraged when these attacks come because you're, you're not doing anything wrong. Nehemiah said, remember the Lord who is great and awesome. See, you guys, you young guys, you think awesome is a word you invented. <laughs> Give me a break. Nehemiah used the word awesome. Right, Jeff? <laughs> Nehemiah... Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight. Fight for your life. Fight for your home. Fight for your family. Fight for this city. Fight for the habitation of God. It doesn't mean that you stop building. I've seen some people who, who just decide, you know what, I'm just going to pick up a sword and I'm going to study the sword for 25 years. And they can tell you everything about spiritual warfare. And they can tell you, they can name all the demons in this town and where they live and where they came. And they can name this and they can do that and they can tell you this and they can tell you that. But they're not fighting. They're talking. And Nehemiah doesn't say, remember the Lord who's great and awesome and talk. He doesn't say that. He says, you keep that trowel in your hand because we've still got half a wall to build here, but pick up a sword and deal with the enemies that would come against you and stop you. The fact is that the enemy is on the attack. Uh, the fact that the enemy is on the attack, it means that you're doing a whole lot of things right. Anybody under attack right now from the enemy? Raise your hands. Someone close to that person, look at them. Keep your hand up. Clo okay. Someone close to that person, just say you're doing a lot of stuff right. Tell them right now. Hey, you're, hey. Hey, Steve, back there, you're doing a lot of stuff right, buddy. You're, you're doing a lot of stuff right. If you're under attack, you're doing a lot of stuff right. If the devil is not bothering you, no, I won't have you lift your hands. <laughs> it could be that you're not bothering him. I don't know. But don't give up on what God has begun in your life because, because the enemy would come in and demoralize you and discourage you from the calling and the purpose and the plans that he has for you. But I, I, I believe this with all of my heart, beloved, that God is raising up, thank you. God bless you. Whew. Let's start over. Nehemiah chapter four. <laughs> I've been trying to preach up here. I can't see my notes to save my life. No technology in heaven. There is no need of a sun or moon, the revelation says. The light is, the Lord is the light of the, of the city. I love that. Where was I? Now that I can see my notes, where was I? No, here's, here's what I want to say. I, I honestly believe that God is raising up a people and he wants you and I to be a part of this who are skilled in both the sword and the trowel. We need to be skilled in both, and we need to use both. We don't need to take a lot of time talking about the trowel and talking about the sword. We need to be using them. Hallelujah. 
Big difference. Big difference. Uh, reclaiming the ruins and reestablish. I, I just, again, I go back to the commitment that I made to the Lord in the beginning of the year. This thing of, of reversing the fall of the family, that takes a trowel and it takes a sword. And not talking about them, but doing it. We've got to do stuff that reverses the fall of the family. We have to do stuff that fights and defeats the enemies that come against our homes and against our children and against our teenagers, against our marriages. And the Lord is calling for a people who are committed to reestablishing the habitation of the Lord. And we do it with the sword and the trowel. The sword is the weapon of spiritual warfare. The sword is prayer. The sword is praise that moves the hand of God. And I'll spend more time uh, talking about this, but again, it's, it's, it's a dangerous thing because if I don't preach it right, then, then we could spend months and 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 months talking about prayer and praise. Prayer and praise. Let's have a prayer and praise seminar. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it some more. Let's write books about it. Let's study it. Let's, let's sing about it. Let's think, you know. No, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Turn to the person next to you and say, let's do that. Let's, do, let's pray and let's praise. Because it is part of the weapon of spiritual warfare. The sword of the Spirit, Paul called it, which is the Word of God spoken in the authority of the Spirit of God that breaks the lies and breaks the attacks of the enemy that come against our people. It's the same sword that Jesus used over and over again on the, on the, uh, on the day of temptation when he faced Satan. And Satan wanted to give him all the kingdoms if we would just submit to him, just worship me, that's all he wanted. And Satan had the authority to give Jesus those kingdoms. Paul says he is the God of this world, and he could have said, you serve me, and I'll make sure that you have all the power you want on earth. And Jesus said, it is written. Don't tempt the Lord your God. God, he was using the sword of the Spirit, and we need to get good at that. We need to be able to do that, and that's why uh, we've asked our cell groups this year to, rather than, rather than just doing a lot of studies on personal felt needs, let's study the Word of God. Can we just do that? Can we just take the Bible and actually study the Bible? So our cell groups this year are studying the book of Philippians. We're not doing that just to be traditional. We're doing that to say, this is the sword that you need to get. Hallelujah. You can read books about the sword all day long, but you need to know the sword. Hallelujah. And so that's what this is about, beloved. Beloved. It's about picking up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Paul says, and learning it and walking in it and swinging it and doing it. It's the name of Jesus. The sword of, the spirit, the, the, the sword of, of spiritual warfare is the name of Jesus who has authority over every other name. Hallelujah. Any of these names of any of these tribes that came, came against Jerusalem, Paul says in Philippians 2, the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. And so we understand the authority of the name of Jesus Christ and we learn how to use it in spiritual warfare. The sword of spiritual warfare. And with the sword, with the sword, we stand against any opposition that would come against our children, our homes, our marriages, our church, our fellowship, our love for Christ, our love for one another. We begin to deal with it that way. The sword is the weapon of spiritual warfare. The trowel is the instrument of spiritual work. And among Pentecostals, work has become a dirty word. It's all grace. All grace. What does that mean? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I think it means I'm free. What does that mean? Well, it means I don't have to do anything. <laughs> I can just sit around and just be happy. <laughs> right? Wrong answer. <laughs> Wrong answer. The trowel is the instrument of spiritual work. And so I believe that not only does God want to furnish us with the ability 
and the skill of spiritual warfare, but also the ability and the skill of spiritual work in this church. And in fact, the two go together in this text that uh, the, the sword is used to fight the attacks that keep us from doing the work. If we're not doing the work, he's not attacking. And some people are great with that. <laughs> Too many Christians are fine with that. Okay, I'll put, the, I'll put the trowel down so that I don't have to use the sword. And that's where a lot of people sit. And the Lord is saying, no, pick up the sword and the trowel and get busy. And get the work done. Hallelujah. With the trowel. We begin to do the spiritual work of strengthening the lives around us. We begin to do the spiritual work of loving one another. We begin to do the spiritual work of manifesting the kingdom of God in our lives. And the way that we know, uh, John said, the way that we know that uh, uh, we are manifesting the kingdom of God is that we love one another. And the world sees that. The world sees that. When we do the spiritual work of serving the Lord and serving one another, with the trowel, we build the wall of the Lord in our children, in our families, and in our homes. We build the habitation of the Lord in the place that we work and in the place where we worship. They are not separated. There's Secular work for a Christian is an oxymoron. Let me say that again. Secular work, the term secular work for a Christian is an oxymoron. Wherever you go, it's not secular anymore. Hallelujah. Whatever place you step into, that place just stop being secular. Why? Because you're there. You're there. And part of your nature and part of your calling is to transform that place into a habitation of the Lord. And God wants to give you the ability to do that. Hallelujah. How many have just, in, over your time, you know, in your job, you've been able to talk to somebody about Jesus? Anybody? Lots of you, lots of you. That's awesome. See, you are bringing, it's not just about coming into the church and his, this is the habitation of the Lord. I don't believe that. This is a habitation of the Lord, and when we gather together, we become equipped, we become strengthened, we become encouraged, we get healed. Things happen to us so that we can go out there and continue building the wall. Hallelujah. The habitation of the Lord is wherever you set your foot, whether it's with your, in your home or in your work. And the Lord is wanting and calling for a people who can pick up the sword and pick up the trowel and build the wall. It's the cry of his heart and he's crying to you. Hallelujah. And so the enemy's gonna come and he's gonna fight you He's going to try to discourage you and demoralize you. But remember the Lord, who is great and who is awesome. And pick up that trowel and pick up that sword and fight. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? Perhaps there are those of us this morning and you, you, you've stepped down from the wall because of discouragement. Perhaps you were demoralized by a fellow believer. That happens. You were, you were hit, you were broadsided by a family member. You were hit by a direct attack from Satan himself and it hurt you and you step back. For others of you, it just got to be weary. It just, you, 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 you were so excited in the beginning, but that excitement has just waned, not because of any so much specific attack, but just, Peter talks about becoming weary in well-doing, and you've just become weary. And you stepped down from the wall and said, you know what, I, I'm just gonna let somebody else take care of it for a while. I've done enough. I've done my part.
For others, you're in that situation and you're saying, what is wrong with me? What's wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you. Nothing wrong with you at all. In fact, those who've been hit by Satan, those who've been broadsided, there's nothing wrong with you. Nehemiah never chewed out the Jews one time. He never got angry at them for, for uh, backing off of the wall. They were under attack and they didn't know what to do and they backed off. He didn't, he didn't chew them out for that. What he did was he said, remember the Lord. This is about the Lord. This is about Jesus. It's not about people. It's not about stuff. It's about Jesus and you. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight. You'd say, Pastor, I've stepped off the wall, but I, 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 want, I want to pick up the sword and the trowel and I want to fight. I'm asking God for the strength to do it. If that's in your heart this morning, would you just slip up your hands? I want to pray for you. Yes. All over this room. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Lord Jesus, you see the hands of these dear ones, Lord. And any spirit of condemnation, I stop now in the name of Jesus. Any demoralizing lie that would come against these who have lifted their hands especially, I stop it in the name of Jesus. And I pray that there would be such a spirit of encouragement and grace as we reset our minds and remember the Lord. It's so easy when we get overwhelmed to just look at all the layers of wall that haven't been built and to look at all the tribes that have surrounded us and are jeering at us that we're going to fail. And to look around and see people who used to know us and love us and now they're, they're mocking us. It's easy to get our eyes on those things, Lord. But I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of Jesus that you would come into this room right now and any who are weary, any who are broken, oh Lord, set their mind and their heart once again to remember the Lord who is great and who is awesome and empower us to fight. I pray that over the weeks and months ahead, Lord, you would take us as a body of believers and make us men and women who hold in one hand the sword of the Spirit, the sword of of spiritual warfare and are adept at fighting the battle for our lives and for our homes and for our loved ones. And that in the other hand, we would hold a trowel and we are adept at the work of the Lord, the spiritual work that needs to go on as we build your kingdom as we bring your kingdom into places where darkness rules and reigns right now. Minister to your people with strength and with peace. Where we need healing in our bodies, send your word and heal us because it's an attempt to drag us off the wall. Where we need uh, healing in our spirits because of offense, we lay that offense down, recognizing it as pride, and we give it up. And we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God 